Um, so I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce our uh, three panelists. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Hall, uh, who is an associate professor of political science here at Middle Georgia State University. He's been with us uh, since 2015. His uh, doctorate in political science is from uh, Auburn University. Uh, I'd also like to introduce our colleague uh, Annie Watson, who is an assistant professor of political science, uh, just joined us uh, last year in uh, August of 2021, and her doctorate is from uh, the University of Georgia. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, her expertise is in uh, things like human rights and women's rights in particular, so I'm sure that she has lots to uh, contribute there. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Thomas Matchock, who is an instructor of political science here at Middle Georgia State. He's been with us for about a year and a half or so. Um, and uh, he is a former professor at Air University, uh, UNC Greensboro, and the Army War College. He is also the executive director of the Joint Civil Military Interaction Network, uh, which deals with uh, things like uh, humanitarian issues and uh, things like that. So definitely something relevant to what we're talking about today. And uh, his doctorate is from uh, Nova Southeastern University. And uh, his uh, doctorate is in uh, conflict uh, resolution negotiation. And uh, last but not least, or probably least actually, uh, I am the moderator, Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and associate professor as well. And uh, I'm in my 10th year here. And my doctorate is from the University of Mississippi. So um, how we're going to uh, do things today, um, basically, is uh, we're going to start with a few uh, questions selected by the moderator with the help of our uh, participation or our, our participants. Um, uh, while we're uh, asking those questions and while they're answering those questions, you're also welcome to ask questions in the chat. We'll try to get to those in um, some sort of order. Um, or we'll try to prioritize questions from uh, MGA students, uh, and if we do have some other people in the community members as well here as well, we're happy to have questions from them as well, uh, as well as you know uh, other people from the community as well. Um, uh, and uh, we'll try to answer or try to let everybody who wants to ask a question at least have one question each. So if you do have more than one question, you know please try to uh, uh, focus on your one question until you move on to ask another. Um, and uh, please be uh, courteous and civil to each other um, in the chat window. Uh, I do reserve the right to kick people out if they misbehave, so um, just bear that in mind. And uh, let's see. So, um, so some of the questions we're going to talk about today, I'm just going to show you very briefly some of the things we're going to talk about, the background of the conflict, uh, what's Russia's goals in the conflict, if we can figure out what those are, uh, the response of Ukraine and other uh, actors as well, like the U.S., the European Union, NATO, regional actors, what sort of impact this could have on or is having on vulnerable populations. And uh, last but not least, um, how these events may affect other conflicts and nations, both in the region and globally. So I will uh, make this slide go away so you can see uh, our, uh, oops, that's, is that what I want to do? Um, yeah, we'll try that. Okay, so, um, so I'll let, uh, Everybody get started here with our first question. Um, so, um, so to kind of get us uh, start off here, um, how would you summarize the current state of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine? And I don't know if anybody wants to go first on that. I will jump in if no one else is. And uh, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Thank you to everyone joining us tonight, especially students. Thank you, Dr. Beek, again, the Dean, for being here with us this evening. Um, this has changed so dramatically from a month ago when Chris and I were putting this together. Uh, we like to do several of these a semester, so for anyone who enjoys this tonight, there will probably be more coming. The questions were theoretical. What will happen? What do you think will happen? Well, now we know what has happened, and what has happened is a war in Europe. Uh, for the first time in my lifetime, since the Clinton administration in the 90s, um, the Russians have invaded. Uh, President Vladimir Putin's aspirations of growing or bringing back the Soviet empire of old have begun. Um, the devastation that we're seeing on the news, uh, the, the attack, the constant perpetual attack on the capital of Kyiv, uh, fighting has occurred in the east, the south, and north. Russian soldiers have come in from Belarus, from the north, from Russia uh, to the east. From the Crimean Peninsula, from the south, and this is a nightmare. That's the quickest summary that I can give you. Again, originally this 
question would have described what could potentially happen. So, well, we're in that now. So what is happening is quite literally the worst thing that can happen. Russia has attacked a sovereign liberal democracy with an elected government, and there are obvious negatives. There are surprising positives that we're seeing, and that is the extraordinary bravery and resilience of the Ukrainian people. Uh, the fact that we are almost a week into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and we're, we're not talking about Russia's puppet government that they're about to set up. They haven't even gotten to Kyiv yet. Uh, they still haven't taken Kharkiv in the east, the second largest city. Um, their invasion has been somewhat unimaginably slow against this uh, Ukrainian uh, defense. So that is extraordinary. We're also seeing an, an unimaginable unity from not just the Western nation states of the world, uh, we're also we're seeing extraordinary unity from the EU, from the United States, from NATO. Obviously, we're seeing the world coming together and condemning uh, President Putin for what he's done. Uh, when given the opportunity to vote yes or no uh, to um, formally rebuke what Russia has done, the fact that China abstained uh, was in and of itself extraordinary. The fact that Turkey is saying they don't want uh, belligerent Russian naval forces to come through the Bosphorus. These are extraordinary examples of the world looking at what President Putin is doing and almost unanimously saying this is horrifying. That's a quick summary of where we are. Uh, the other um, panelists can take that into a multitude of directions, uh, but I'll turn it over uh, to Annie or Tom. Annie, would you like to, to go ahead? I, 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 to... Sure. I, I think John did a great job talking about the, the kind of state of military and the global response we've seen as well. This has moved so quickly that I made sure to check in just a few minutes ago to see sort of what today looks like. And so just today we have seen the first face-to-face -to -face talk, face -face talks between Russian and Ukrainian officials since the invasion began. Uh, those talks did end without a resolution. Everybody who's a party to these talks has, has now gone back to their respective capitals to consult with their leaders. We have seen the Treasury Department announcing that it's going to freeze assets of the Russian Central Bank that are held in the United States. They are imposing sanctions on the Russian Direct Investment Fund. There are other countries freezing assets as well and implementing their own sanctions. Uh, we, soccer's global governing body has suspended Russia uh, and its teams from all competitions. And sort of in the at the same time, we're also seeing a really large convoy of Russian forces moving closer to Kyiv. This is a convoy of several hundred vehicles uh, it's stretching out at least 17 miles with just this one convoy alone. And so we're seeing, sort of like John said, uh, the tensions are rising, the bad things are everywhere, but there are also some very strong responses from the international community as well. Sure, uh, uh, John, Annie, certainly you, you, you identify some incredibly important points. And I, I would just like to add uh, a little bit or build on what you um, both had, had spoken to. One of the things I would suggest is that certainly, you know, what are we seeing today? One, it's an incredibly fast moving um, event, fast moving uh, train. And it's incredibly difficult for us to get it into focus um, while, while it's moving this rapidly. And so as you, uh, I think, point out, Andy, I just, gee, I, <laughs> You know, all of us, you know, watching the TV or, or doing our, our social news on, on phones, you, know, you just can't keep up with it. I mean, um, as soon as you read one thing, you know, 30 seconds later, you, you're realizing something else. What I would like to add to the to the discussion is that certainly uh, what we do see or what we do know is that Russia is certainly challenging the transatlantic security structure that, that's been in place for more than 70 years now. What I would, would suggest is that Ukraine is also uh, presenting us or, or demonstrating to us how just com how we completely misunderstood what we were seeing. And I, I appreciated that at the very beginning, the, um, the title of uh, posturing or World War, World War III. And it, it brings me to the point that uh, we see or we are looking at, and I say we, 
big picture, are looking at Ukraine through World War II lenses. And we are stuck in a peace war binary. Um, we're believing that, well, if we're not at war, we must be at peace. Well, that is not the way Russia viewed it. And from the end of World War II on, Russia has considered itself at war with the West and very specifically the United States. Now, over the years, through many, many different administrations, we attempted to reset our relationship with Russia. Certainly Germany thought that if it opened up markets and bought oil from Russia, it would change its behavior and enter into the community of nations. None of those things have happened. And we knew that uh, along the way for the past 70 plus years. And, and uh, one of the ways we know that is that Russia invaded Georgia and, and controlled uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And it went in on the pretext that it was protecting Russian, ethnic Russians from, uh, from the Georgians. That was really proof of concept because the West really did not push back against that. And when Putin realized that we didn't push back against that, he pushed into the Donbass and Crimea in 2014. And again, the West did not push back in any meaningful way. And so we had, a, we had for all these years, a, a, we, we saw over all these years events that led us up until we were, uh, until we are now, and we should not have missed them. They, they were clear and obvious to us, but we, we, we got stuck in this peace war binary and dot, did not realize that Putin saw this or, or Russia saw this as clearly a confrontation against the West. And our goal should have been to manage the confrontation so that it did not slide into a conflict or into combat where we find ourselves today. So I, I, I just want to swing it back I, because I think that was an incredibly important uh, question, political posturing or World War III. It depended on what side of the line you're standing on. On ours, it was political posturing. From the Russian side, it was, we've been at war with you since the end of World War II. And uh, so, I think where where are we at today? <laughs> we're in a we're in a mess uh, of our own of our own uh, device. I mean, I, I don't know how else how, how else to put it. Um, so I'll I'll stop there. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. So um, you've anticipated uh, all of you have anticipated some of my later questions. So um, so some of these may sound a little repetitive, but. Um, <clears throat> Nonetheless, I a question that uh, we haven't really talked about. Um, what historical ties do Russia and Ukraine share, and how does that uh, impact the current relations between these two states? I guess I can start us off on this one. So Russia and the Ukraine were two of the founding members of the Soviet Union in 1922. And so we, we see the, the progression through World War II in particular. In 1991, the Soviet Union was terminated via treaty and Ukraine became independent and uh, also got at the time a significant stockpile of nuclear weapons that they later, later destroyed as part of the Nuclear Disarmament Treaty. In 2014, we saw protesters in Ukraine overthrow a, um, a president who was friendly to Russia and have a sort of a, I don't want to call it a minor rebellion. They had a, a revolution where they ended it with a um, election to the best of my understanding of a new regime. In 2014 later in April, we saw Russia invade and then annex Crimea. Uh, they signed ceasefire agreements in 2014 and 2015. Uh, and so we've seen this sort of increasing tension in the area over recent years, but ultimately it goes back to the idea of them being founding members of the Soviet Union and President Putin in particular being um, convinced about their, the sort of necessity of their continued alignment in this way. Absolutely. Uh, Annie, I would uh, backpack on what you have just said. You, you nailed it there. Uh, you can actually go back further in terms of Russian 
and Ukrainian involvement. If you go back to the birth of the very concept of Russia, uh, you will be in what we now call Ukraine. From the ninth century onward, uh, Kiev was the, the, the genesis of what we now know of as Russia. Uh, there were many centuries where multiple uh, powers would uh, have control over that particular area of Eastern Europe. In the late 18th century, uh, the Imperial Russians uh, take Ukraine back into the fold. Uh, then we can fast forward uh, into, as we've already mentioned, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Ukraine is independent for a couple of years, but then becomes a part of the Soviet Union in 1920, all the way through the Cold War until the collapse in 91, which Annie has already uh, picked up from there. The history is deep. The history is long. Um, one thing that I've had uh, several students ask me in terms of the history is why does Russia care about Ukraine? Um, there's another historical component there. If you're familiar with Europe, there's a portion of northern Europe above um, several uh, mountain ranges uh, that represents a flat plain that allows you to get straight into Moscow. Uh, it's perfect for French armies under Napoleon. It's perfect for tank armies under the Nazis. Russia has a reason for wanting this buffer zone between themselves and Western Europe. Uh, that's another element. Russia has always and will always be interested in Ukraine. Uh, in terms of where we are today, a lot of this is going to fall onto the unique personality of President Putin, uh, which is something that we'll get into later. Uh, but again, he is, in terms of the history, he remembers the Soviet Union. He called the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 the single worst thing that happened in the 20th century. Now, if anyone here is familiar with history, a lot of things happened in the 20th century. We're looking at World War II, World War I, the Holocaust. Uh, the devastation of Manchuria by the Japanese in the 1930s. We have the Depression. A lot of great things happened as well. But if you look at the entire 20th century and consider the fall of the Soviet Union to be the single worst thing that happened, and you actually mean it, that puts us into the head of President Putin. Uh, that desire to bring back the glory of the Soviet Union of old, and he was and his plans are to start that, not start that, because again, uh, Tom, you, you mentioned his uh, escapades into Georgia, um, his uh, uh, the violence with the Chechen rebels. But he is his intentions are to rebuild the Soviet Union, starting here with Ukraine. I did not foresee him going with a full scale invasion the way he has. We can talk about that later. Uh, but the history is quite literally very deep, and it will never go away. Yeah, I, yeah. John, were you done? I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, certainly, absolutely. The, um, it, it's been a troubled relationship, and if anything else, uh, between uh, Ukraine and um, Russia, and, and no need to go into that long history that both of my colleagues have have. have um, Articulate. I would, I would say, and I think that when to understand that troubled relationship, we at least have to begin in, in the Middle Ages. And at that time, uh, Ukraine, that area, and Crimea were incredibly heterogeneous. And it was um, following uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea in 1774 that that heterogeneity began to, began to um, uh, disappear. And Catherine, uh, back to our history again, under Catherine the Great, there was a move to bring a lot of Russian, ethnic Russians into, the, uh, into what is Ukraine and, and Crimea and change its ethnic character. And, and the reason I bring that up, why I believe that's important, because it's the same strategy that Putin had followed in Georgia and in the Donbass was to move ethnic Russians into those areas uh, in Georgia so that he could create a fiction that he is moving to protect the rights of ethnic Russians in these regions and that he was ob that he's obliged to do that. So that I, I was just always I always found it curious that he was following the same strategy as Catherine the Great. Um, the other is that with this troubled relationship is that Ukrainians have never considered themselves any part of Russia. 
And my experience in working with uh, with uh, Ukrainians has been do not make the mistake <laughs> of, of calling them Russian. <laughs> Uh, because you'll be corrected very quickly. You, because Ukraine's history is really to the West. It was really Poland and Lithuania under which Ukraine developed and, and, and emerged um, in, into the world. And so it's always been a Western leaning country. It's always been a Western leaning uh, 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 people. And probably if I wanted to find that one spot and, and my colleagues uh, discussed it where, where this relationship really if there was a relationship, came apart. It was in it was in 1932 with the um, the genocide in Ukraine, uh, commonly referred to as extermination by hunger, where seven and a half a million Ukrainians were killed under the Stalin regime. And memories are long, and uh, for many of us in the West, where it's hard to remember last week these these types of events live in people's memory as if it happened yesterday and that's part of that 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 ukrainian uh ukraine's uh, collective unconscious it, it, part of it it's 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 culture and and anyone who's been in any of my classes is probably tired of hearing me say that culture trump strategy that culture always wins and, and so uh, I think when we look at that relationship, it's certainly a troubled one. And it's, it's one that at least has its roots probably back to, to 1560s, as, as John, as you had mentioned, 1569, I think, uh, when, when Ukraine uh, was part of, of Poland and Lithuania. Um, so my, just some additional thoughts. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, certainly the point about the uh, Holodomor is you know well taken. I, I think that's something that probably a lot of people in the West really don't know that much about. Uh, and so you know that, as you say, you know memory, you know that was ninety years ago, but you know still memories run deep in particularly in Europe. Um, I also was kind of struck by the idea that Ukrainians being insulted by being called Russians is kind of like trying to calling a Scottish person British or, or English. Uh, so. Um, uh, putting that levity aside, um, and John sort of got into some of this before, but I want to see if you would elaborate. Um, how would you summarize the effect of uh, President Putin's personal experiences and perspectives on his current foreign policy decisions regarding Ukraine and, for that matter, I guess, the, the rest of the Russian near abroad? Uh, just I'm sorry. Who, who, who did, you, did you direct that at somebody, Chris? I'm sorry. I did not direct it at somebody. Oh, okay. I guess it's kind of your turn to go first, though, if you do want to go first, Tom. <laughs> uh, no, okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's an incredibly, uh, incredibly important question. But certainly, as, as we look at a great man theory of leadership and those different, different types of things, and, and I think uh, both John and Annie even spoke to the point uh, where one of the goals, uh, and we'll talk about it, I think, later on, uh, of of Putin is to reestablish the Russian Empire. His his goal is to to bring back um, uh, the glory the glory of Russia as he as he sees it. And and we've all we've all been we've all read this in the news and and have certainly seen it on on television. But I I really think his KGB experience it cannot be um, undervalued. Uh, Putin had had said that is on the record as saying that the fall of the Soviet Union was his saddest day. And that, that he wants to, he wants to undo that. He wants to, his, you know, here he is a 70 year old guy. He's, 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 he's looking to reestablish the glory of, of Russia and the empire and himself. Um, and, and be there with, uh, with the czars and, and Stalin and, and, Rest, rest of these folks, and I think that's the way he sees the world. And Putin is not a grand strategist. He he's not a military theorist. He's not a political scientist. He was a, a KGB agent. He was the worst of the worst. Um, 
And he's carried that mentality, I believe. And that's those are the, again, like we look at World War II lenses. These are the lenses through which he sees the world. These KGB lenses. There's there's us and them. There's good and evil. There's no gray area uh, for them. And so I, I, I uh, and again, he, he's not an intellectual. <laughs> As I said, he's not a strategist. He's none of that. And so um, we have a, a, a very dangerous man in the Kremlin right now, who does not have really an, a, a, an, an academic or an intellectual foundation with which to make informed decisions. Um, arguably, uh, I think it was yesterday, he just, he just turned to his, uh, his generals and said, put our nuclear uh, forces on high alert. That, if, if we, th- it, I, we know from our background how dangerous uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was when our nucle- our planes with nuclear uh, nuclear uh, weapons were put in the air because of an offhanded comment um, at at that time. So this is this is incredibly dangerous stuff when you um, you have someone who does not have that background, who does not have that um, that uh, that gravitas as a political or military leader. He's just a, he's just a, he's just a madman uh, right now. So I hope I was clear enough. <laughs> what did I, say? I, uh, I didn't want to jump in front of you, Annie, but I agree. Uh, Tommy did a fantastic job summarizing that. The, that brings up the scary thing that we might get into later. And that is that while I don't have a degree in psychology, I think I would be, I'm comfortable considering President Putin something of a sociopath. Um, and his his goals of reestablishing a Soviet empire, I, I recognize that as what he wants. But the terrifying thing is, unless he is aiming for Moldova, he is out of countries once he gets beyond Ukraine, if he can. Um, the former Soviet Union is mostly in NATO, and Article 5 would bring in all NATO members if he were to try uh, to go into Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia or Poland or uh, Romania, that would be World War Three by definition. So to uh, just to piggyback on what you were saying there, Tom, I agree completely that that is his goal. And that's terrifying because I don't know where he would go from here without stumbling into World War Three. De facto. May I just have an alibi real quick on that one? Because I just want to, uh, John, if, if I can, you know, you know, it, that, that is, <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right in, in that, psych, that psychological background. And, and one of the things that I, I think is, as you're right, I mean, unless you go look at, he's got two people, like you said, like he's got, um, you know, uh, Belarus and, and as you said, go, go to Moldova, whatever. But here's one of the issues. If we remember back at at, George, at uh, when he first went into Donbass in 2014, I believe it was the the uh, Polish Poland's prime minister. I think it was his prime minister who was caught on a hot mic, saying that he he did not believe that the United States would come to the defense of Poland. That was an incredible statement, and and again back to that psychology. If you're if if he's make, is he he's making a bet. What is it? Just rhetoric or would? The NATO allies all stand up and actually go into a general war in Europe. Would would we, would would we be willing to tell a mother in in Bug Tussle, Iowa, your son or daughter needs to go defend Estonia? And and, and again, I, I know where I stand on this. I'm just suggesting it, it's we're betting. We're we're putting all our cards. If we're in Vegas, we're putting all our cards on the table that we're going to back up Article Five. Um, that's an open question right now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Annie. Thank you for the, the alibi there. I would, to that point, one of the grand principles of international law is pacta sunt servanda, promises must be kept. And so if we do not uphold the NATO agreement, uh, I worry what that means for other agreements as well, uh, which is sort of a... a separate consideration entirely from what we're talking about with uh, President Putin's um, mindset. 
And so while I, I'm going to steer away from trying to diagnose him psychologically, because that's not my background, uh, I can speak a little bit more to the context that he's operating in, which is a general fear of sort of a predatory West, predatory West. And uh, as both of my colleagues have already pointed out, many or most of the former Soviet republics, most of their allies in Europe have already joined either the European Union or NATO. Uh, NATO in particular is very strong militarily, but the European Union also has a great deal of power. And part of the reason that we have seen this push in Ukraine is because Ukraine also wants to join and is actively trying to join both of these organizations. And so this could be kind of a, a final death knell almost for Russian power in Eastern Europe. We've also seen a couple of other recent events that uh, would be expected to drive some of Putin's choices in this time. And so first we saw the switch in the U.S. administration from President Trump, who was quite friendly with Putin and spoke quite negatively of NATO, to President Biden, who is much more committed to the alliance and much more outspoken against Putin. But we've also seen last year opposition groups in Russia had some of the largest anti-Putin protests in years. And so there may be some attempt here to energize nationalism at home and try to get more support from himself uh, in order to, to kind of stave off some of these protests. And so we've got multiple forces acting on President Putin uh, beyond just Ukraine itself. Some reasons that, that uh, it would not be, it's certainly unreasonable, but it would not be out of the realm of possibility for these to be some of the considerations he's got on his mind. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, again, you know, some of this may come back to a question of, you know, uh, what sort of rationality do you expect from a madman? But, um, you know, what, what are the goals that Russia is trying to achieve with this invasion, and uh, are they likely to be successful in achieving them? Great uh, question. I'll jump in on this. There, there are certain goals that we don't have to speculate. We know um, President Putin has demanded that Ukraine not be allowed into NATO ever. And, and of all the demands outside of not being able to be dictated to that way, that's actually something that's possibly accomplished. There's a reason Ukraine is not in NATO right now. It's not just that Germany and France didn't want them in, and there was a reason for that. And that reason was what we're experiencing right now. If, you, if Russia were to invade Ukraine and they were a member of NATO, World War III. And, uh, time to bring up a great point. We don't know if we our commitment would be uh, what we would like it to be. I think we would. Uh, it would be a collapse of NATO if the United States did not respond. I have to believe that Putin has in his mind and his calculations, as bad as they've been lately, uh, the thought that the United States would militarily commit uh, to NATO. There's a huge difference between the overwhelmingly uh, vague language that exists between the U.S. commitment to Taiwan versus U.S. commitment in Article 5. Um, so he wants Ukraine to not be a member of NATO, and he wants demilitarization of NATO nation states that were brought in after 1997. That will never happen. Um, that is something that is not, it's not possible at all. And again, for any students out there uh, in all of our classes, uh, in terms of that 97 before or after that gets us into a lot of Eastern European nation states that were once in the Soviet Union. Uh, that actually was viewed by Russia, and some could argue, understandably, as kind of provocative on the part of NATO. We have pushed NATO up to um, Russia's very boundary. So uh, that's another element uh, for President Putin, and it is this rage at uh, NATO's aggressive push up to uh, Russia's borders. Uh, so those two specific requirements, one possible, one impossible, um, are what Russians want specifically. Uh, beyond that, we've addressed in terms of President Putin's desire to rebuild a more powerful or something resembling uh, the Soviet empire of old, uh, which again, I consider to be impossible. Right now, in terms of the goals, I think they would just like to take Ukraine. I don't think anyone thought a week into a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine we would still be sitting here wondering if they can conquer Ukraine. So no membership in NATO for Ukraine, 
and pulling back military forces from post-97 NATO members in Eastern Europe. And again, as of right now on the ground, conquering Ukraine, militarily subjugating the Ukrainian people, which has proved to be an overwhelmingly difficult uh, task for the Russians. Uh, the Ukrainians, again, I think we're all aware if we've watched the news, have redefined what it means to be brave. They have redefined impressive uh, for a population, for an elected president. That being said, just from a military perspective, if Putin doubles down and, and says, and I don't see how he can't, and this is what's so scary, if he doubles down and says, I have to take Ukraine now, this is the the respect and honor of the Russian military on the line, if he starts to unleash an unrestricted air campaign and artillery campaign against Kyiv, it could become even more disastrous. But I would throw that in as what President Putin is looking forward to most right now, and that's actually doing what he started out to do. And of course, we all hope he can't. Okay, I, I, I can I can jump in. All right. And, and, um, and I, I just want to swing back to a point you made. I, I, I could not agree more about your your comment regarding uh, international law. And it, I, I would I would then add to that that uh, both the Minsk and and Budapest memorandums were 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 um, also disregarded. And in that Budapest mem memorandum, I believe that we made a commitment that if um, if uh, Ukraine hand, hands all of its nuclear weapons back to Russia, we would guarantee its security. Uh, so that alone, it, 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 I just want to bring that back. I agree with you. I agree that we should own up to our commitments and, and we would have to start with the, the Budapest one uh, that we did not. Well, the, the, yeah, I would say, yeah, absolutely. They're the, uh, Melinda Harding was writing in Foreign Affairs on uh, a few days ago, and she had, I think, proposed uh, four objectives that she believes Putin has, the four of which I agree, or she sums it up nicely. Uh, the first one is, is to stop the westernization drive, and I think, John, you spoke well to that, this idea that we brought NATO right up, uh, up to the borders of, of, uh, of Russia, and that this is a Putin can see this as a as a, a security threat, and, and 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 Russia for centuries has had security problems and, and saw everybody as a security threat. So that's nothing new. I think the other goal he has is clearly to destroy NATO unity, and I think to some degree he's betting that the longer he can keep this going, the harder it's going to be to maintain that that NATO unity. Um, certainly before this, uh, before Ukraine, there was a rising nationalism in Europe as well. And one, one has to wonder, will, will that nationalism raise its head again? Will that begin to fragment the unity of, of the alliance? Um, will, will countries begin to go in their own direction if, if he can keep this, this going on? The other goal, I think the third goal, is he wants to humiliate the United States. And that enough said about that that's kind of clear all on its own <laughs> and and fourthly he wants to rewrite the european security architecture and he he's created this fiction as well i think uh to add to what you're saying uh john he's, he's created this fiction that nato is somehow a security threat to russia the the this is just this is hogwash this is this is there's no security threat from nato to russia and he knows that. Um, what threatens Russia is a prosperous and democratic and vibrant Ukraine on his border. That's what scares him, that his population sees Ukraine as prosperous and democratic. And when you add the other Baltic states in there, Estonia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and then, of course, uh, Poland to, to furthest to the south, Baltic state, then this is what threatens him. And so he, I, I, and that it's, so it's not, it, it, the, the fiction is that somehow, and I've, I've seen um, Mirheimer and others argue this point that, oh, uh, we should have never allowed uh, NATO to advance. We should never have allowed those other countries to become part of NATO. Well, uh, that's, 
every country has the right to its own sovereignty and to choose who it partners with. And to your point, John, I think well made, nobody <laughs> has partnered with Russia. And so uh, uh, I, I believe those, but his goals are that, are to, to uh, stop the westernization, not necessarily the military threat, but the westernization, that the, the democratic values, that structure. And, uh, and he want, the way he sees he can do that is to destroy NATO unity. And one way to do that is to let this, to, to not have a lightning strike. I, I would think that would go against his, um, his goals. If he, has, if he has a lightning strike in the Ukraine and takes right over, then this doesn't drag on um, and, and begin then to stress, uh, stress NATO unity. Um, and and uh, that's how he rewrites the, the European security architecture in that way. If he can, if he can, if he can let this thing uh, go so that the 29 countries begin to begin to fragment. I think we've done a pretty good job talking about the goals that Russia is trying to achieve. And so I'll focus more on whether or not they're likely to be successful in achieving them. At least so far, NATO is not giving in to Putin's pressure. So in December, Russia made a list of demands to NATO. Uh, John touched on some of them, but some others include uh, backing out of the the Bucharest, I believe, uh, declaration. So Ukraine and Georgia were, were f there's a formal declaration that these two countries would eventually be welcomed into the alliance. Uh, and so they, they demanded that they back out of that. And on Thursday, the NATO chief invoked that declaration. So that is still in effect. Uh, NATO has spoken quite negatively about the implication that Russia could possibly choose who it allows into NATO and, and who it doesn't, and have guaranteed as recently as Friday that while they might be open to talking about Russia's security concerns, that same dialogue would have to include things like Russian missile deployments and satellite tests and disinformation efforts. And so, so far, the we have not had any indication from NATO that they're willing to concede on any of the demands that Russia has offered to them. And we've seen some analysts uh, really expressing concerns that Putin knows this and is setting up kind of a list of impossible demands so that there's really nothing to stop him from continuing with the war. Uh, there are some who have, have disagreed with that approach and have said that maybe these are the opening positions and, and open to some wiggle room later. Uh, but there are certainly concerns that, that this is really just meant to, to set him up to not have to, to back down. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, kind of following up on that one, um, to some extent. Um, are there any specific vulnerable groups in the region that are suffering or likely to suffer disproportionately as a result of this conflict? I, I can I can jump in if it's if it's OK. Uh, yes, the, uh, the short answer is, is yes. And I, I just started marking down a few that um, I think are, are vulnerable groups that oftentimes aren't considered uh, when we think about conflict or combat. One, one is the elderly. Um, another are those who are handicapped. Uh, those in, in wheelchairs, those who uh, uh, have difficulty in mobility problems. Um, we, we begin to see uh, now how, uh, children being born in the middle of uh, in, in the uh, in the uh, subway uh, at, at night. Uh, I was listening to uh, the Polish, uh, Poland's ambassador to the UN talking about the number of babies that were uh, born on the on the border by by refugees coming across. Children are certainly certainly uh, an affected group of people that we we don't often think of. We we of course we have debates in our country about whether or not our children should wear masks in school, uh, but thinking of children in a war zone. Um, or as refugees who are, are moving around um, effectively as, as internally displaced persons or as, or as refugees is, is something. 
Um, another we don't often think of are, are those with mental illness as well, that, that it, it, to understand what is, is going on and to, and to make decisions and to have caretakers. Um, and and where, where I see these problems in, in, in my background, where I've, I've seen these problems manifest themselves are in refugee camps that, that don't make allowances for people from these populations. Um, you know, you, you, you can go into a refugee camp and never find a porta potty that would accommodate a wheelchair. Um, and so I don't, I don't mean to trivialize it or, or trivialize it, but, but th these are groups of people that somehow become absent and, and unseen in conflict. Um, and I think that they need, we need to pay attention, uh, to those folks, uh, to those folks as well. Um, hey. John? I, was, I was waiting on you. I didn't want to. I, I would add to that a couple of other groups as well. I, I completely agree with, with everything that uh, Tom has named so far. But in addition to that, we know, for example, that women disproportionately suffer during times of conflict. In fact, we have a, an entire United Nations Security Council resolution, that's 1325, focused on the issue of gender during times of conflict, because women and girls are far more likely to be targeted for not just physical violence, violence broadly, uh, but also sexual violence during any kind of upheaval, both during the upheaval itself and after when you're trying to, to reestablish peace and, and structures in society. They're also much more likely to be ignored from or excluded from peace building talks and peace building efforts uh, as part of sort of those same refugee camps. We know that there are often not enough restrooms, period. Uh, restrooms split by gender also. Uh, and so what you have is girls who are increasingly unable to go to the restroom at night for fear of being attacked. Uh, in this particular case, beyond sort of gender broadly, we also know that members of the LGBTQ plus community are quite concerned. I've seen interviews that uh, with members of this community saying that in Russia, LGBTQ people are persecuted and their concern is that if Russia occupies all of the Ukraine or even a big part of the country, they won't allow them to exist peacefully. They, they won't be, um, not even just won't be supportive of them, but will start or increase attacks on them. The right to marry is not supported in Ukraine right now either, uh, but these interviews have, have talked about how the country has made some recent advances and they're worried about seeing all of those protections get stripped away. One other specific community in the Ukraine are the Roma. And so this is a problem with Ukraine and Ukraine's practices uh, beyond this particular conflict. This is something that organizations like Human Rights Watch have called Ukraine out for uh, repeatedly for a long time. But anytime you see a conflict like this, what you see are heightened abuses. Uh, and so I, because of the, the, the already uh, quite overt discrimination against this community, I would expect some concerns about how they're treated by security forces and how they're treated in, in refugee camps as well. Uh, great and very thorough responses there. I don't have an enormous amount to add. There, not a group of people um, that I would throw into this specific category, because again, y'all did a great job of hitting groups that are uh, tragically uh, targeted or or ignored in, in wartime. I am not turning this over to then look at men who are not seen, but the 18 to 60 year old group. Somewhere in Kyiv, there is a political science professor who is a lot like me, mid 40s, who by law now has to say goodbye to his family and go and be given a machine gun with absolutely no training whatsoever and go face the Russian army. Now, as amazing as the uh, Ukrainians have been in their uh, defensive struggle, that has to be terrifying. It's almost unimaginable to be quickly brought up on military tactics and then, hey, there's the Russian army. Let's go fight them. That would also be terrifying. But again, 
uh, y'all did a much better job uh, in identifying uh, those groups that are often uh, neglected and often specifically attacked. Thank, can I just swing back one? Sure, I, because I, I appreciate what you 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 brought up, Andy, and I just wanted to uh, swing back to the, the, the part about women and protection of civilians, um, which is is certainly uh, crucial. And you 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 um, filled a hole that I did not have on my sheet right here. One, one of the things I want to talk about is um, one of the things we see in Ukraine too is something much much different than we saw, uh, for instance, in Syria and Afghanistan. When when those uh, countries began to uh, to collapse, all the, the 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 males of fighting age left. If we if we see all those photographs of of, of Syrian refugees, we saw our refugee you know, Afghan refugees. You see f uh, males of fighting age leave. What we're seeing in Ukraine is the opposite of that. We're seeing we're seeing uh, women uh, as as refugees and IDPs moving westward, and the males moving eastward. Uh, and I, as you pointed out, John, the, the law in, uh, in uh, was it 18 to 60, I think, in Ukraine, all the males have to stay. And they are. <laughs> um, and as you said, that they can find, I had a, a colleague of mine uh, taught, uh, joined, uh, taught a course, we taught a course together at the National Defense University in Ukraine. And, and he, he, he texted me uh, on, 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 on a chat and said, you know, I've just dropped my wife off and, and my son in her village close to Poland, and I'm headed back to Kiev looking for a weapon. And, and th this is that, that cultural mentality that is going to be so difficult uh, for, uh, for the Russians to uh, wedge out. And, and you, I think, Andy, your, your point it's, it, uh, it is, is critical um, as well about, about uh, how poorly uh, women are, are taken care of when we talk about IDPs and, and refugees. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Annie. Hey, sorry. I, I just wanted to highlight, especially since we're talking about civilians and their treatment, we do have some very weak numbers on, on what's happened so far. And so coming out of uh, the UN, Michelle Bachelet, who is the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, said that by Sunday night, so that's not including today, her office had already reported 102 civilian deaths, including seven children, and had confirmed that more than 300 people have been injured. Uh, we've also seen, I think, we're above 500,000 refugees out of Ukraine by this point. Uh, and it is it is wonderful and necessary that refugees from Ukraine are accepted into neighboring countries. Uh, but I do think it's it's something I noticed one of my colleagues on Facebook actually earlier today mentioned that there's a, a real gap in how refugees from this crisis have been treated in the media and have been treated by neighboring countries compared to how we've seen refugees coming out of Syria recently, for example. Uh, there's been significantly less pushback to accepting them in their, in their countries. And so it is so important that we, we do make a place for refugees and that we protect them and that we, we um, provide them some place to go. But I think we can't have any discussion about refugees without also acknowledging that some refugees are treated very differently than others. OK, thanks, Annie. Um, <clears throat> so um, we, we've had lots of questions in the chat, and I'm not sure I, well, I know we're not going to get to them all. So um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, here's a question that um, I actually originally had scripted, but a number of people have asked about it as well. So I thought it'd be a good kind of jumping off point. Um, how might uh, Russia's success or failure in Ukraine have an impact on Chinese policy towards Taiwan? That That is a trillion dollar question there. Um, I'm going to cheat and go two different directions. Number one, if Russia is successful in Ukraine and outside of incredibly significant sanctions, uh, there is no military pushback from NATO. If Russia is able to consolidate control over Ukraine, install a puppet regime and move on from there, Intuitively, you would think that Beijing would look at that as a as a relatively good rational argument for their ability to then go on eventually at some point and militarily take control of Taiwan. On the other hand, what is happening now uh, could force Beijing to recognize all of the negatives that go along 
with just deciding to take over a foreign nation state that is sovereign. Now, with regard to Taiwanese sovereignty, there's a there are there's a uh, it's far more questionable in terms of how Beijing, of course, looks at them. Uh, but there's two different ways as as the the horrible failure that that's actually good in this case by the Russian military would have to make Beijing recognize that this is not a foregone conclusion that you're going to come in and conquer another uh, population with great ease. Um, but again, those are the two directions that I'm seeing for Beijing, and we don't know which will be which because we're not finished yet. But at this point, if I were Beijing, I would be more hesitant to even think about invading Taiwan. If, on the other hand, it winds up being successful for the Russians, then it could be a precursor for China to go ahead. So I'll turn it over to the rest. I agree with John that that those are probably the, the two main routes it can take. What I will add is that the Taiwanese government has explicitly stopped, asked the world to stop comparing them to Ukraine. Uh, they're quite concerned about the effect on sort of public morale and, uh, as well as I think disturbing the peace maybe too far, uh, but they have as, as late as today suggested that the two cases are very different, that their their geography is different, their place in the, um, the economic pipeline is very different. Uh, and so they and China actually as well have, have argued that these two cases are very different. Now, at the end of the day, if Russia is successful in the Ukraine, I agree that that, that is going to have some, some impacts on the Chinese uh, mentality around this issue. But at least for now, the two actors are, are requesting that the world stop comparing the two. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, I, John and Andy. When I, when I saw this question on the, on the sheet, I immediately thought of, uh, of the old adage, um, if you've seen one hospital, you've seen one hospital. Um, each one of them is uniquely different and each conflict is uniquely different and looking for uh, to make uh, analogies can be a fool's errand. Um, so I, I, I sort of fall down on that. It, that is that, that they're just two completely different conflicts. They have uh, different histories, different uh, different actors. And I, I sort of, yeah, I, I, I just can't see how they're how they're connected. But, you know, we could make that connection. I agree with you with your meet, which you said, John. I agree that that both both are correct um, approaches. Um, it's just I think they're so uniquely different. And I, uh, the, the Taiwanese asking us to please stop comparing. I think they're making a great good argument um, uh, there as well, because historically there's just not a lot of similarities. Um, to to I, yeah. I agree, Annie. Uh, Tom, great points. From my perspective, what makes them similar, if one authoritarian regime, I, I refuse to consider Russia an illiberal democracy anymore. I don't know why I have for so long. If one authoritarian regime conquers another nation state and the world lets them do it, and then there's another authoritarian regime that wants to conquer an, uh, another nation state and they saw the world let them do it the last time, that's the connection. I mean, y'all are both right in terms of the actual logistics, the situations, the governments, the histories, very, very different. But at the end of the day, authoritarian regimes can or cannot conquer their neighbors in terms of whether the planet Earth lets them do it or doesn't. That's the connection. And right now, the Russian invasion has been so extraordinarily incompetent. Uh, and again, I don't mean that as an insult to any Russian people. Um, I mean, that is a direct insult to the, the hierarchy of the Russian uh, defense, uh, President Putin, not to take away from the extraordinary valor, valor of the Ukrainian people, bravery that I can't even comprehend. Uh, and I don't think you can unless you're in that situation. In many instances, we're talking about columns of Russian armor running out of gas, they're not fighting this on the moon. This is a neighbor. It is almost incomprehensible that the Russian military would go into Ukraine with such extraordinary gaps in their logistics. That's one of the more peculiar elements of this uh, campaign is how incredibly bad the Russian military looks right now and how great the Ukrainians 
uh, up here, and how, how great they are fighting to protect themselves. But the incompetence shown by the Russian military is astounding in my layman's eyes. I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't have a PhD in military history, but I'll, the floor is open. No, you, no, I think I think you, I think you're right, John. And if I could, just on top of that, we were we were talking in in the, in the class uh, today. There's there's an old adage as well in the military, and I'm sure you've heard it. And that is that uh, amateurs talk tactics and professionals talk logistics, and uh, that's that's the game. You know, when you're attacking, you know, there's certain principles. Uh, you know, three to one. You have to have a three to one ratio uh, when you're when you're attacking as a minimum. You certainly want more. I'm saying if I was in the military, I want more. I want every advantage. I want an asymmetric fight. I want every advantage I can get over my adversary. But yes, I mean, we're, we're dealing with a, a conscript army. Uh, we're dealing with uh, Russian soldiers who have no idea where they're at, what they're doing, or why they're doing it. Um, you know, the, their, their commitment is has always been questionable. But there's always been a, a tendency for many of us um, to, to make these people, that make the Russian military these, you know, 10 foot giants, you know, this, this, this massive wave of, of Russian military that, that will come across the border. And, you know, as you said, they're being stopped by essentially civil defense forces, uh, people who did some weekend training to learn about how to shoot a rifle and do first aid. And they're, they're bringing it to a grinding halt. And to your point, uh, because of, of, you know, if you can't get fuel and food <laughs> forward, um, and secondly, how are you going to opt, uh, if, you, if you are successful, and I don't think they will be, I don't think they will be successful, but if they were, the amount of resources it would take to occupy a country the size of Ukraine, the third largest country in Europe, <laughs> that, that's just an incredible amount of resources that would have to be committed. Um, and and if it if it um, devolves into a um, into a, a, a guerrilla kind of fight, it's just going to be ugly. Uh, it's just going to be ugly. And uh, so, yes, I, I I I think your points are well made, John. Thank you. I really appreciate the sort of a passing comment you made about the Russian troops not knowing where they are. One of my favorite things about how Ukraine has responded as a people, their national road agency issued an order to take down all the road signs. And so people around the country have just been taking down every possible way to navigate. Uh, and we've seen, I think it's Google that has also cut off like live uh, traffic transmissions and some things. And so the, there are agents actively working for it to make it difficult for them to know where they are. Uh, also, to John's point about the kind of uh, calculus of authoritarian officials, I absolutely agree. And Ukraine has actually argued that some of this was, uh, if not caused by, but at least precipitated by maybe, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. They suggested that this might be a sign of, of weaken weakening American resolve abroad. And so this is, this is a test of not just American uh, resolve, but also the world's resolve to intervene when we see this just extreme level of of injustment, injustice, and encroachment on sovereignty norms. Yeah, if, if I could make one last comment, you you reminded me of it, uh, and, and 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 John, and that is um, the, the you know, 2022. Uh, we now have more authoritarian governments than democratic governments, so. Authoritarianism's winning. <laughs> um, I, I, I disagree with that. I'm against. That. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm on. But to your point, John, when we look around and say people are looking, and it's authoritarianism that's on the rise uh, right now, and that that is, I think, should cause us all to pause um, and think that through. Okay, uh, <clears throat> so uh, to uh, try and get this uh, some more questions in, uh, I'll throw you guys a softball. Um, would implementing a no-fly zone over Ukraine be a good idea? No, um, that that would be World War Three um, if we were to implement a no-fly zone. I, I get the the desire uh, to help the Ukrainian people first and foremost. As of right now, the Russians still haven't established air superiority. No, as of now. I, I, the Ukrainians don't 
have to have that. But the problem with a no-fly zone is you have to enforce it. If you enforce that, if NATO were to put that in over Ukraine, that would be NATO F-16s, U.S. F-15s, F-22s, um, having to intercept Russian fighters, Russian bombers, Russian transports, and that's not going to end well. So uh, a no-fly zone would be, to me, a guarantee of World War III. Yeah, and I agree with you. I think that the, um, the Ukrainians are doing a mighty fine job right now in knocking Russian aircraft out of the sky. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I figured that would be a pretty easy one. Um, I want I want to ask you about the tweet from an NBC News guy that basically said, "Why don't Why don't we send over some A-10s to shoot up the columns of tanks?" Um, Literally said that on Twitter today. Um, but um, um, anyway, um, you've uh, alluded to this some in your answers already, but uh, how are the Ukrainian people responding to Russia's invasion of their territory? Yeah, I, 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 I you know, and we've touched on it throughout the, throughout the past hour or so. Um, this is incredibly patriotic people. And, 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 and rooted people, grounded people that understand their, their history, their culture, their identity, their place in the world. And um, I, I think they're, they're a unified people. You, you just, uh, because of that, it's all brought together. And, and I said in this, in this, in this patriotism uh, that they have, and you just can't help but be moved when you see these interviews of, of young people, uh, 17, 18, 19 years old, and they're clear on, on their identity and they're going to fight for their country. This is their home and they're not leaving. Um, I think that is a, that is a one heck of a um, uh, strength that the uni, uh, Ukrainian people bring to the fight. Um, and, and uh, you know, I guess no one wants to fight. Nobody wants to be war. That's, that's the bottom line. Um, nonetheless, this, in this defensive act, the people are protecting their homeland, and I think that's – they're doing a mighty fine job. Of, uh, and I think it was wrapped up in, in, uh, in, uh, in Zelensky's uh, comment. Uh, you know, I, I don't need a ride. I need ammo. The, the Ukrainian people are not asking for anyone to come and fight their fight. They are doing it themselves. They just are asking for the help. And I, you know, I had in my notes here for our talk, I mean, I mean Sweden <laughs> gave up its neutrality and is sending 500 missiles uh, to, uh, to the fight. Um, Finland and Sweden are having referenda right now on whether or not to join NATO. I think I can predict where that vote's going. Uh, so I think, uh, I, think it's, I think the Ukrainians are... are are giving us all a lesson on how to fight in this new age, this third millennium. I agree with Thomas. Hard to add to that. The Ukrainians have been impressive. Um, the, the the prospect of Russia not winning militarily eventually, it's a prospect. It's not something that I don't think anyone would have imagined uh, on day one of the invasion. And now that's a possibility, which could itself, especially with the sanctions that are targeting uh, members of the political and military hierarchy of Russia, the longer and harder this becomes, especially with the incomprehensible possibility of Russia losing militarily, could help out in the end by Russia ending this problem with their own uh, solution, and that could be a coup in Moscow. You could see um, those around uh, President Putin taking matters into their own hands as they start to recognize that he is driving them down a, a black hole. Um, so again, the Ukrainian people have been incredibly impressive. I, I don't want to sound like I'm cheerleading too early. The prospects of Russia defeating the Ukrainians is still very, very much there. Um, but yes, they've been impressive so far, but it's far from over. To add to that, I would say that they're being brave in other places as well, not just in Ukraine, but also in Russia. Um, there are thousands of 
protesters, anti-war protesters in Russia, um, many of whom have been arrested. I, I think I saw something about somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 arrested at anti-war protests in Russia. Uh, there are around 300 Ukrainian nationals and supporters who have been protesting in front of the Russian embassy in Seoul. And so there are they are being brave, not just inside the borders of Ukraine, but they're also being brave outside as well, uh, particularly to, to protest publicly in Russia seems like a, a very risky move. And so I um, wanted to add that. OK, thanks. Um, <clears throat> So another question uh, from the chat, I'm kind of fusing together two or three questions that kind of ask more or less the same question. Um, so assuming, I know this is a bit of a big assumption at this point, um, if they do succeed to some degree in Ukraine, uh, what is the next step for Russia here? Is this a stepping stone to trying to you know, uh, reclaim the Baltic states, the Caucasus, you know, uh, Moldova? You know, where, where, where does Putin think he's going next, if anywhere? If, he does win, uh, I put that in quotation marks, in Ukraine. Um, great question. And again, the reason I threw Moldova out there, it, it's the only geographically neighboring uh, European nation state left that's not a member of NATO. Uh, if the Russians were to achieve military victory and somehow conquer the entire nation state of Ukraine, subjugating their military, the 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 vast majority of resources in out of a dwindling number of economic resources that Russia will have will be dedicated to maintaining and securing Ukraine for the rest of time. Uh, again, I agree with uh, uh, Tom. There is no pacification of the Ukrainian people. They have shown us already that that is not the direction this will go, even if they do have to downshift into insurgency. So. To answer the question, that's a great question. Um, their future will lie in continuing to fight in Ukraine forever because the Ukrainian people will make them. And then the possibility, again, I keep going back to this because this is what I think about and smile about at night when I wonder about how this could possibly end. And that would be a coup in Moscow that somehow ends without President Putin being President Putin. I also think the, the international community would have to start asking itself even harder questions. Say, say somehow, somehow, a horrible somehow, Russia was completely su successful with Ukraine and they did not need every ounce of their resources to, to maintain its control and did start looking elsewhere. At what point does the international community have enough? Uh, if we, we don't stop it now, if we don't stop with Ukraine, who are we willing to to sacrifice to Russia next? And so I, I think that what we are seeing right now with the wave of support coming from international organizations and individual countries and for-profit companies, uh, what we're seeing is a complete intolerance of this action for Russia. And so I can't imagine that that would at all decrease uh, enough to let them stay but, but certainly enough to let them expand elsewhere. Yeah, if, if I could, I would, if I could add to that, and, and um, again, expanding out of, the, out of that peace war binary uh, I was talking about earlier. Of course, when, when we look at, at, at Ukraine, when we look at, at, at this, um, it's in front of us, one of the things I, we need to consider, I think, is, is, are all the elements of national power. Uh, diplomacy, information, um, military and economic. And when, if we look at it as, as uh, combat, conflict, confrontation. So um, the, the combat may end and this, con this, what we see will then morph into a conflict and ideally we could move it back into a confrontation and then manage that confrontation. Um, so I, I think that's what we're going to see. We're not going to see a, a military victory or, or defeat. We're going to see this morph from active combat into a, uh, into a conflict. 
And so then we, we enter in, 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 we are in it now, but even when it just, when the shooting stops, we still are going to follow a multi-domain fight. And we're going to bring all those elements of national power uh, forward. And we're gonna, we're gonna take this fight on in, in, in these um, uh, six, six uh, domains, human, land, cyber, sea, space, and air. Uh, I mean, we're going to fight. We're going to fight cyber-enabled info wars. Uh, we are going to fight uh, cyber battles. We are going to uh, we are engaging in asymmetric hy hybrid uh, in, uh, activities. So th this is is not going to end. I don't see that we're all going to get together on the USS Missouri and sign a peace treaty. Um, we're we're just going to see this. And th this was the issue with with the end of the Cold War. We were in a confrontation <laughs> with the Soviet Union beginning in 1945, and up until uh, up until the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and and we fought that battle in many different ways. Whether it was you know through uh, you know small regional wars with proxy fighters or, or or whatever, but this this confrontation has been going on for uh, for quite some time and will continue to go on uh, for for quite some time. Um, one of the things I did, I, I had in my notes, I wrote down, I think it might work. I, I just want to swing back too that when the, when the Soviet Union did collapse, interestingly enough, uh, three Soviet leaders, Medvedev and Putin being two of them, uh, advocated for NATO membership. They wanted Russia to be part of NATO. Um, again, back to this, this creative fiction about NATO being a threat that, that, uh, I know Yeltsin, uh, Medvedev, and, and Putin all talked about joining NATO. So, you know, just kind of, kind of makes it foolish to say I, I, I want to join the the security threat <laughs> to my nation. So. I did want to piggyback off that just a little bit. You mentioned cyber battles and how those will occur. They're occurring now as well. And so what we've seen are reports from a lot of big social media sites that they are actively trying to, to track down misinformation and, and attacks on Ukrainian officials in particular. So Meta, Facebook's new company name, said Sunday that it had shut down influence and hacking campaigns targeting its users in Ukraine. Efforts were tied to people in both Russia and Ukraine, and a hacking group thought to be affiliated with Belarus. Twitter has said that the company has removed more than a dozen accounts that participated in these same campaigns. They blocked a number of links from being shared on Twitter. YouTube has shut down five channels with not particularly many subscribers. They're not getting a lot of traction, uh, but they've, they've been shutting down accounts. Uh, Meta has also detected a hacking operation that targeted military leaders and politicians in Ukraine, as well as at least one journalist. Uh, and so this is, there are, are cyber, cyber battles already happening right now. Yeah, and, and, and to that point, thank you for bringing it up, Anne, because the, the, the key point there is one of the things we want to do is, um, is prevent as many simultaneous dilemmas as we can <laughs> to our adversaries. Uh, to overwhelm and, and stress their decision-making processes. And, and so, yeah, to, to your point, that the, the battle is going on inside. We don't see it. You know, it doesn't, it, uh, it's, not, it's not like you can see a tank. You know, you can see an, a helicopter, but you can't see a cyber fight. Uh, but these are incredibly important um, activities in, in creating those overwhelming simultaneous dilemmas that you, you, the, the adversary just can't deal with. And, and so they just, you stress and their whole system just collapses. And so to, to your point, I think it's well made. It's one of the, John mentioned earlier that he likes to warm himself falling asleep at night with thoughts of a coup in Russia. Uh, I'm being warmed by the thought of these companies actually stepping up increasingly. We saw them staying uninvolved far too many times leading to violence and, and destruction. And so for them to to be trying now is at least progress on their parts. I agree, and, and not to take away from the economic sanctions and the global community, I think President Putin has made it very clear he does not care. He, he could not possibly care now. I don't think he will care later. I think he is viewing the world in a different way than we are. Um, hopefully I'm wrong. Um, I, I just, to me, I don't see how this ends without a coup in Moscow, which again, I will wait for. 
It, and, and if I, it, this, that makes great good sense, John. And if I, and if I could, I would swing back to Andy real quick because an earlier comment about, um, you know, the, the cyber battle and, and uh, the Ukrainians taking down all the road signs and doing all those kinds of things, which is very interesting because in 2014, uh, when uh, Russians were moving into uh, Crimea and into the Donbass region, the, the way we knew where all the troop movements were was because all well, the Russians were taking selfies with the road signs behind them. And so we were able to track uh, open source uh, troop movements because of uh, of the cyber. So it, it's, it can go one way or the other. <laughs> but it was... Uh, I wanted to point out, since I have, like, on three occasions now in a public forum expressed my uh, desire for a coup, I want to point out that they are, by definition, illegal, and nine times out of nine, I would not be in favor, but in this one case. So just that one case. I'm not an advocate for coups, uh, except Moscow today, right now. I would, uh, this is a little bit of a side note, but one of the groups that we have not mentioned is the Russian people, and particularly with that comment about sanctions, this is also a group that will suffer. And so what we know about sanctions is that without very careful targeting, what you end up hurting or who you end up hurting is the people who are already hurting worst in society, the most marginalized individuals experiencing poverty. Uh, and so that's what we're going to see. We've already seen Russia's economy take a pretty sharp hit because of all of the sanctions and, and actions being taken by global actors. And while there are some efforts to target those sanctions and to target the, the pain at the, the um, government actors, what we will see is that those government actors often have the resources to temper that pain, whereas the average Russian is not going to have those resources. And so we should we should certainly not forget that they are not the ones who have asked for this war. They are not the ones who have asked for, for the violence. I, I think you make a great good point, uh, Annie. That, that is about the utility of sanctions. Um, certainly, uh, when we, we've had uh, some hellacious sanctions on Iran and North Korea for a good long time now, and uh, the track record of sanctions, though they look good and make us feel good, is really not all that good. Um, and I think to your point, uh, those with resources, whether they be an oligarch or uh, part of the North Korean uh, you know, elite, uh, they have resources and they, and they have ways to, to hide money and react and, and do all those types of things. So yes, yeah, it's, it's the folks in the street, unfortunately, that feel the, the, the pain of the sanctions most readily. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so this actually gets to uh, something that uh, John was wishing for, I guess, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, the, the the thing that was sort of popping in my head is, you know, is that, you know, what support for this war is there beyond Putin? In other words, if there is a coup in Moscow, does whoever picks up the pieces, Medvedev or whoever, um, you know, do they do they sue for peace or are they going to double down or, you know, what, is it is Putin the problem here or is there a, a deeper, I guess, bench, if you will, uh, that, you know, if Putin goes, they'll just, you know, next man up, basically like Al Qaeda or something. I, I think to the video that we've all seen, um, I forgot the office, it was a defense minister, the dressing down of one of his officers right before the attack began when uh, Putin was asking him about his support for annexing um, the, uh, the particular areas within the Donbass. Does everybody know what I'm, one of his many famous uh, meetings with his his version of a cabinet where he is sitting at one end of a mile long table and all of his um, his supporters are off in the distance. It was very clear to anyone watching that Putin was bullying this man and he was literally putting words into his mouth. He would say, I would support and Putin would stop him. You would support or you do support. Uh, it was overwhelmingly clear that at least with this one individual who, forgive me, it was a defense minister. I forgot his name. Yeah. I think he was, his, the, was, he was the head of intelligence. His intelligence. Okay. He, he was clearly bullying this man into saying exactly what he wanted to hear. So that is anecdotal evidence. I don't have anything beyond that. Um, so I just thought I would throw that out there as the possibility that, yes, President Putin is, in fact, the problem. I am sure there are old guard, uh, former Soviet um, 
officers within the upper echelon of Moscow that are overwhelmingly uh, big fans of this operation and expanding Russia further, wherever that might be. Um, but that's a great question. I think Chris hit, hits the million dollar question. How much support is there um, in the Russian government for this? And how many people are just going along because they know what happens if they don't? Yeah, if, if, I, if I jump in real quick, John, build on what you were saying. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, you're, you know about what, you know about a coup. I, I said the, the, the challenge with the coup is, it, it, I guess, um, definition-wise, it leaves the same government in charge, the same system. And I would argue it's the, the, it's the system, it's the structure of the system that is um, is wrong. And, and so, to, to your point about authoritarianism, so I get. And that was telling when I watched that intelligence chief. I mean, it was, it was his expressions <laughs> uh, were, were incredible when he was being dressed down by Putin. What, what I would add to that is, um, is, is Putin has the, the support of the oligarchs. There's a, there's a lot of people in Russia benefiting from what he's doing. And their interests are in protecting themselves and advancing their their own interests. And Putin does that. Putin meets that need for them. Now, to, to your point, if he oversteps and the oligarchs begin to uh, feel the pain, then then things can shift ma- rather rapidly um, if, when he's no longer useful uh, to the to the uh, the money power, the, the, the oligarchs, the corruption of Russia to begin with. Yeah, I think that's going to be that. That's how you got to get moved. You got to get them oligarchs hurting. Um. We could also potentially see some generational shifts. I I think that older generations are probably still more uh, attached to or embedded in the kind of Cold War uh, tensions and disagreements and and hatred and and headbutting cultures. Uh, But I don't think that younger Russians have that same attachment to it. I think that they are less willing to go to war in in general, uh, but particularly for this kind of reason. And it, generations take time to change over, but Putin is starting to age and there is only so much more time that he can have control. Now, whether it it outlasts him, whether we, we see the perpetuation of the system, even with with him gone, uh, that remains to be seen. But I think that, that younger Russians in particular, as they, they start uh, getting older and having more resources, if we, if we have hope, I would find it with them. Okay, thanks. Um, so if, um, well, we're, we're getting close to our closing time, uh, but I, I don't know if you'd be willing to indulge maybe one last question, um, and then uh, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, so this question came from the chat, uh, or sort of came from the chat, um, or came from multiple chat questions, I guess. Um, <clears throat> with, uh, in Western Europe, you know, Germany and some of the other countries, um, you know, they, they rely very heavily on uh, oil and gas exports from from Russia through Gazprom and the the various pipelines and things like that. Um, to what extent would developing alternative sources of energy um, and alternate sources for their current energy needs perhaps uh, affect geopolitics going for, forward in terms of their dependency on on Russian exports? Yeah, that, that's a great question that you could ask any country. I mean, how many situations do we see where a petroleum exporting country through that economic reality has the ability to, if not dictate, but influence the foreign policy decisions of other nation states? Europe has a problem. This is a weakness. They do currently, compared to U.S. efforts, uh, they're, they are somewhat leading in terms of uh, alternative uh energy development in terms of uh, solar and wind. In Germany in particular, I don't have any raw data on me here, but I do know that many Western European countries are advancing there, but that's a problem. Uh, That's a bad answer. Um, It's a weakness of Western Europe. But at the same time, given the economic uh, sanctions that are already on Russia, if 
the Putin administration were to aggressively cut off all oil to Western Europe, I mean, he's in a position where that's almost economically suicidal, I would think, not that that would stop him. So I'm going to stop this rambling answer with that's a problem and I do not have the solution for Europe other than advancing other sources of fuel, uh, particularly alternative energy, renewable energy. Yeah, that, that, yeah, yeah. Like you said, it's uh, oh man, what a, this is a, this is a tough one because um, you know we look around the world too and look at uh, and we characterize Russia as a as a gas station with a flag essentially. Um, you look at other other uh, Saudi Arabia. You look at um, uh, Iran. Th- these are, these are not necessarily <laughs> the good actors out there. Um, you know, so we're, we're still a carbon based world. And this transition to to green energy or alternative energy sources, absolutely, uh, we know that we have to move in that direction. Uh, However, in the interim, during that transition, you know, are we willing to to hand the the keys to the car over to the drunk? And, And that is those people who possess the oil, the energy needs that industrial states need to move to, to operate. And, uh, you know, right now we're not in a position, we don't have enough windmills or, or, or hydroelectric or uh, to, to, to compensate uh, for carbon-based energy. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. We're in, the, we're in a really tough spot now. Uh, we know where we have to go um, and, and we know we need to get there quickly. But until we can, we've got some bad actors out there who who have some have some influence on uh, countries' foreign policies and economic growth and development. Yeah, and I'm rambling now, so I'll stop. I I suppose I'll pick up and take the ramble just a little bit further and say that while Russia doesn't have. Uh, I mean, I found one quote earlier that said that they're incredibly unimportant in the global economy except for oil and gas. And that is largely true, but not entirely true. And so what we have seen as well is that they are also, uh, they and Ukraine are also strong contributors to food production. And so Russia is the world's largest supplier of wheat. And together with the Ukraine, it counts for nearly a quarter of total global exports. And so uh, that flow of grain makes up more than 70% of Egypt and Turkey's total wheat imports. This is going to put further strain on Turkey. Uh, They are also, so Ukraine is known as the breadbasket of Europe and sends more than 40% of its wheat and corn exports to the Middle East and Africa. Uh, And Lebanon gets more than half of its wheat from the Ukraine. And so this is it's not just Russia who is affected by this situation, it's also Ukraine and Ukraine's exports and the countries that depend on those exports. Uh, and always the, the people who suffer most are, are the poor, the people who, who can barely afford food to begin with or can't afford food to begin with. What we're seeing already are food prices rising. And I, it is important to do things like power our cars, it is necessary. It is necessary to be able to heat our homes, particularly in very cold countries. Um, but we we can't overlook how important it is to to have these food supplies. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any closing comments you'd like to make, but um, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, but um, nonetheless, I, I did want to give you that opportunity. One thing before I do open the floor for the last time. Um, if you are an English 1102 student and have not posted that in the chat, please do so. I know some of you may not be looking at the chat, so um, so be aware of that. Uh, it is the uh, second icon on the top right of your screen, I think. So from the left, kind of hard to describe. It looks like a bubble. So um, anyway, um, uh, uh, John, did you have anything you want to add? Uh, in the interest of time, I will just summarize the situation. We have a war in Europe, and it is terrifying. Uh, what makes it less so is the extraordinary bravery 
uh, of the Ukrainian people who continuously impress us and show us the new ways to be impressed on a daily basis. That was my quick summary. <laughs> well, I guess I can, I can get it. I you know, uh, echo uh, John's uh, comment. The, we, we have to be um, impressed by the courage and bravery of the Ukrainian people who are standing up, not, not just for Ukraine, but for the world. Um, they, they, this is a global fight. And uh, this is set to, as I said, to um, uh, disturb all of the international institutions that have developed post-World War II. Uh, and, and, uh, and the Ukrainians are on the front line and they are, they are holding it together uh, for the, the world right now. And I, I also do want to say that um, NATO, the EU, the transatlantic alliance um, this that have been tested, they have stepped forward and they are, have met this uh, met this uh, this fight, I think extremely well, extremely well. And uh, the the unity, the 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 the, um, the, the, the way in which uh, all countries, Sweden, Germany, I mean these these are within 24 hours have made some incredible shifts in policy. I think Germany is going to uh, today a uh, hundred billion dollars extra to defense, going to enshrine the two percent uh, NATO requirement in their constitution. Uh, Sweden giving up, Sweden giving up neutrality. These are we are seeing some incredible tectonic shifts in the international uh, community right now. Uh, all because uh, all being allowed by the, the bravery in, uh, of the Ukrainian people. So I, I do want to echo exactly what you said, John. Both of you have done really beautiful jobs talking about the Ukrainian people. And so I think I'm going to add a little bit more about the international community. I Many of the international principles that we hold dear, like the responsibility to protect, for example, came out of international failures. We saw international failures to intervene in really horrible situations, in genocidal situations. And so my my great hope is that we have the opposite of that here, that the international community shuts this down. And that's a message to the rising number of authoritarian governments that we see around the world, that the, the world will not tolerate this kind of activity. Uh, I, I fear what becomes of us if they do not. That was not the hopeful message to end on. Uh. That's OK. Um, uh, nonetheless, uh, that is probably where we're going to have to uh, leave things off for this evening, because we have been here for an hour and 40 minutes and probably could be here for another hour and 40 minutes. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your great questions. Sorry we didn't get to them all. Um, if, if you're in Dr. Hall's class, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer those questions for you uh, on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, or if you're in Dr. Matchock's class or, or, or Dr. Watson's class for that matter, uh, or any of our classes, I'm sure we'd be happy to answer the, uh, some questions as well. But um, that kind of uh, leaves us for this evening. So I'd like to thank our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. John Hall, Dr. Annie Watson, uh, Dr. Thomas Matchock uh, for their taking their time out of their evenings. I'd like to thank you guys for uh, coming out this evening, uh, our uh, fellow uh, students here, as well as our faculty and staff and community members. Um, if you're interested in watching this again for some reason, uh, we will uh, have a, a video of this uh, posted on our brand new Political Science Department YouTube channel, which I just set up two hours ago um, later on today. So um, I will be sending out that link to at least some people that asked for it. Um, and uh, if you, um, again, if you have any other questions, let us know. Um, keep an eye out for future events. And uh, we, um, I guess, uh, have, a, have as good an evening as you can under the circumstances. Thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Thank See you, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. See you, John. See you, Annie. Thanks, everyone.